Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Real Time Revolution. Uh, this is Signal R in action. Um, before we get started, I always like to tell a little bit of a story. I'm an independent consultant uh, in the United States. I work with a variety of companies all around the world, um, various countries, and I get the most like basic questions that come across my email. And I always try to do like a 15 minute call, just get an idea of where people are. And I had a client come last year, give or take, and they said, Kevin, we have an application, uh, not an actual screenshot, I swear. Um, I, I'm not very good with CSS. I could probably create something a little bit prettier in CSS if I tried. But their app looked like this, and you probably have an app as well that looks similar to this. It's some icons up in the top right corner. There's a menu or toolbar, and it does some stuff. And they say, Kevin, we have this application, and we have two very important icons on this page. We have a, a little envelope that tells people when they're getting new messages that come into the system, and then we also have this global alerts notifier. Well, what happens is when stuff happens in the app, these little icons pop up and say, you have two alerts that you need to know about, or you have five new messages that you need to be aware of. And this is different for every user, and it's up to date no matter how many tabs I have open at any one time. And you probably have seen this dynamic before. If you've used Facebook or any similar applications, you understand what the badges do. If you don't open them, they go away. Stuff gets synced back to the server. The, the way they accomplished this was they had their app, so we talked to the web server, and every now and then it would go and say, I need to know the number of unread messages that I currently have. Or it would go say, well, what are the number of alert notifications that I need to be aware of? It's the client specifically going to the server asking it for information. It's doing a pull request, technically. And would do this, both calls, every five seconds. Every five seconds. OK, not a big deal. Except you make this assumption it's just one person using your app. It's not really one person using your app. It's multiple people using your apps. And if your users are anything like mine, they have multiple tabs open, multiple windows, maybe on multiple devices. They're all hitting the same server, and they're all getting the same information over and over again. And they took the process of trying to optimize in different ways. They couldn't necessarily cache that information long term because it's always changing. Stuff is always happening on the server. Those statistics are always changing. So they try to do funny things with like tab caching. So one tab might go grab the information and share it with their other tabs. And they try to over-architect what could be a simpler solution. And they went to their telemetry. And their telemetry said that 90% of their calls were those two specific endpoints. Because every client, every five seconds, was hitting them, trying to get new information. That wasn't necessarily changing all the time. So we ask ourselves, and they asked me, and they paid me, Kevin, is there a better way that we can accomplish this? Well, you already know there is, because you wouldn't be here if there wasn't a better way. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Griffin from the United States, uh, Microsoft MVP, independent consultant. My primary focus in life and career is building web applications on ASP.NET Core and deploying solutions of Microsoft Azure. So I'm happy to be here with you all today. If you ever like to reach out to me afterwards, you can go to my website, consultwithgriff.com, or hit me up on Twitter, at OneKevGriff. I would love to chat with you. Uh, I also have a best-selling course on Udemy, uh, on SignalR, which I went and grabbed the screenshot in pounds today because dollars wouldn't have made any sense to anyone. Uh, so it's really cheap at the moment. You should go grab it. But I'm not going to push my course any more than this. Let's talk about a better way to solve that problem. I have my app, I have my server, and the ideal solution, you probably already know the ideal solution, is to just set up a WebSocket between the clients and the server. Because there's this great thing that happens when the server gets a message, it knows everything that's happening. It is the ultimate state of truth for our entire ecosystem. If an email comes in, the server knows about it. If a direct message comes from another client, it knows about it. If the database is 
needs to be updated, the server knows about it because the server's the one doing the work. So the server's aware of everything that's happening in our app. So why couldn't the server just send that message down to the client to tell it that something had occurred? Email comes in, the server sends the message down to the client. The client increments, decrements, ch changes its notification to reflect what the current state of the server is. And this works really well at scale. So instead of all these various clients making calls, multiple calls, every five seconds to get various pieces of information, they just establish a single connection, a WebSocket, and when something happens, the server will notify whomever needs to know about it. Now, it might not be every client that needs to get a message. It might be uh, specific clients. It might just be your one tab or your one tab or your one tab. Everyone gets the message that they need at the time that they need it. And even better, what if we could have a system where I write code one way, but that code supports not just uh, web pages, it could also support multiple devices, Windows app, uh, Windows services, mobile apps, um, you name it. What if I could write one server implementation that could feed all these different types of applications that I'm building? So you probably already guessed that that solution is Signal R, which has been in the ASP.NET framework since 2013. I believe was, that was the first course I had created on Signal R. Um, it was added as this way to really make WebSockets more approachable to .NET developers, because if you ever had to program a raw WebSocket, it's easier now than it was 10 years ago, but it's still kind of a pain in the butt. It's a lot to manage, especially across numerous users, and SignalR just abstracts all that away from you. Even better, if you have a case where WebSockets isn't supported, you don't have to change your code in any way. SignalR is automatically going to find the best way for your clients and your server to communicate with each other. So I kind of want to jump out of slides for a minute. I want to start just running through some basic uh, demos. And when I say basic, I mean basic. Uh, I have this philosophy when it comes to SignalR that the simpler the demo, the better. There's so many folks that want to show you a chat demo. There's an unwritten rule in the SignalR community. You do not write chat demos. If someone writes a chat demo in SignalR, there's any Microsoft folks in here? Good. Microsoft folks, yes? All right, don't tell anyone I said this. Microsoft folks break this all the time. Like, chat, 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 chat. Don't write chat demos. Uh, instead, I'm just going to show you the world ugliest demo. Uh, let's set it up real fast. I'm, I have this starter. This is all on GitHub, so you can see it after the fact if you want. That's not it. And I want to set up what our intention is with this demo. You see, this is the world's ugliest demo. It just says hi. Uh, I have a text box. I have a checkbox. I also have a couple buttons. And there's a couple phases to this demo. Our ultimate goal, and this is 90% of what I do in SignalR, is when I type something into that first text box, I want it to also display on that second text box. Signal R, the majority of the work you're going to do in Signal R is state transfer. Something happens in the system, and I need to notify the clients about it. I need to transfer state when state changes. Now, it doesn't do anything at the moment because we haven't wired up any Signal R. So if I just type Kevin, nothing happens. So let's start fixing that bit by bit by bit. So I'm going to shut down my application. Let's walk through the code just a little bit so you see where we're starting with. I try to keep everything simple again. Uh, our HTML, input box, check box, a couple buttons that we'll get to later. Uh, I have my scripts at the very end for including SignalR plus some other fancy tools. Uh, when you primarily use SignalR in a real application, you're probably using something like Webpack or some sort of build system. Um, so you're going to npm install your SignalR dependency, and you'll just include it wherever necessary. Uh, for this demo, I'm just using SignalR kind of raw, raw JavaScript. But the syntax that I'm using is 
fairly similar to what you would write in TypeScript or just raw JavaScript. The JavaScript itself, uh, nothing up my sleeve. I have a couple placeholders just for event handlers, but there's no single R in this application yet. Well, let's start at the very beginning. In our startup CS, uh, if you're working with new minimal APIs, it's just program CS. But we have two things that we need to do here. The first is we need to configure services for single R. And that's fairly straightforward. Say services.add single R. Single R is already a part of the box when you create a new ASP.NET Core application. No special new packages that you need to install. The second thing we have to do is create a place for our clients to connect. And traditionally, in Single R, this is called a hub. Uh, if you're familiar with MVC, Model View Controller, you understand the concept of controllers. And controller is a place that connections go to perform work. In Single R, a hub is a place that WebSockets go, Single R connections go to uh, basically be managed by Single R. So all of our connections will go through what we call a hub. I'm going to create one called a sync hub. I'm doing a lot of this by hand. And it implements the class or the type hub, which is part of single R. Now this is all I really need to do for now. My hubs don't have to have any methods in them. They can just simply exist for managing connections. If I go to my startup, I have to register that hub with ASP.NET Core. And that's done through the use endpoints middleware. So we'll say configure map hub. I need to tell ASP.NET Core what type of hub I want to implement. So I'm going to say sync hub. And then I have to give it a path. And that path is going to be hubs slash sync. Of course, there's no formatted for C-sharp. All right. So we're going to save that. We're going to go back to our app and make sure this compiles. Nope, because I don't have the namespace. So this is using Microsoft ASP.NET Core Signal R. There we go. All right. That's step one. Step two, let's go back to our JavaScript file. We have a hub on our ASP.NET Core app. It's exposed an endpoint. We need to set up a connection between our clients and our server. So that's done with what's called a connection hub builder. So we'll create a new connection, which will create a new signal R hub connection builder. And I have to tell this hub connection builder where to go to connect. Uh, so there's a couple options on here. We'll say with URL, we'll tell it hubs. Just sync. And then I'm going to tell it to build itself. So R creates the connection, but it hasn't really done anything yet. The connection is created, but we have to go tell it to start the connection, which is done down here at the bottom. And in your application, the connection can start whenever you want to. Um, typically, I try to start the connection as soon as possible when a page renders, just because it's nicer to have that socket open and ready to go for when you need it than waiting until a later time. We're going to say .NET run. We'll open this in a browser again. I'm going to bring up the dev tools this time. Let's do a refresh. Come on. Signal R is not defined. Yes, it is. Signal R, capital R. Yep. 
There we go. So a couple things happens here. Our page renders. You see the first line, we're normalizing our URL so it's fully qualified. Uh, you can also use Signal R across domains. So there's core support. Uh, we don't need that in the moment. But then my second line, which was the start, Signal R does a couple things. You can see we have WebSocket connected at our endpoint. But the process to get there, let's find our network tab. Let's go back to all. Let's bring this up a little bit more. A couple of things happened. Uh, first was this negotiation call. Uh, the client and the server have a little chat. And they ask, what's the best way for us to talk to each other? Because they really want to be on the same page. Ideally, they want to use WebSockets. But sometimes there are cases where WebSockets can't apply. We'll talk about that in a moment. If WebSockets works, they say WebSockets is the way we're going to go. The server assigns a connection ID, which is unique to this tab, this instance. And then the next call to sync is an actual WebSocket that gets opened back to the server with the, with the connection token and such. So now the clients in the server can talk over this WebSocket as much as they want to. We can watch the messages here as they come. These are just uh, heartbeats coming in every couple of seconds. So we've set up the scaffold for now actually being able to send information up and down the pipe. Let's talk about protocols for a moment. So ideally, you would use a WebSocket, which simply is an end-to-end -end connection between all your clients and your server. So the server can send information up to the clients. The clients can send information down to the server. But there are cases where WebSockets cannot be used. Uh, not so much today, but maybe five, six years ago, this was the case. Uh, every now and then, you get a proxy or some sort of VPN. It doesn't allow certain WebSocket connections. Sometimes the server won't allow it or it's disabled. If there's a case where a WebSocket isn't supported, there are a couple fallbacks. There's one called Server Send Events, which has been around since the Netscape days. And the way this works is that the client makes an initial request to the server saying, I would like to start um, Service Send Events connection with you, the server returns what's called an event source back to the client. And this is a pipe for the server to send messages down to the client whenever it wants to. And this is fantastic. However, it doesn't work as well when the client wants to send messages to the server. The fallback is that the server just makes traditional AJAX requests or post requests to the server whenever there's a message that needs to get made. So this pipe is dedicated just for the server uh, to go to the client. And it will work in 95% of cases where WebSockets isn't supported. For all the other cases, there's the final, final fallback, which is long polling. Uh, long polling is just simply opening the request to a server. The server maintains that connection until it has something to say. So if there's no messages that need to come down to the client immediately, that request is just going to stay open. As soon as the server has a message to send, sends back the response, the connection closes, we repeat the pattern. The only time that the request would get terminated prematurely is if the timeout expires on the client side. This could typically be about two minutes, but it's customizable based off the browser. This is the final, final fallback, just because this will work all the way back to IE6. Hopefully, no one's supporting IE6. If you are, raise your hand so we can laugh at you. Excellent. Uh, so just quick comparison. Normally, you're going to use WebSockets. It's the de facto standard nowadays. It's an always available connection between a client and a server. Uh, there is a con, because it's an always open connection, that you could potentially exhaust your socket pool uh, in your application. Don't ask me how I found this out the hard way. Uh, if we have time, I will tell that story. I have learned that you can DDoS yourself accidentally with WebSockets. It's a good story. If WebSockets aren't available for any reason, proxies, VPNs, say not, uh, we fall back to server send events, which are great. But the only issue is that the client can't use the server 
uh, the event source to send messages to the server. So it has to fall back. Uh, and then finally, long polling, which works across all browsers, it's just horrible. It, it's actually the problem that we had at the very beginning of the talk, where we're constantly making requests to the server over and over and over again. Uh, so that's the worst case scenario. And you might be thinking, Kevin, do I have to write the code to handle all these different cases? Well, this demo right here will handle all three of these without any code changes on your side. The only thing you could do or might want to do is you might want to tell your app, don't use long polling or don't use service end events, only use WebSockets. That's just a quick configuration um, option, and you can do that. I don't recommend it unless you have a particular use case, but that's all you need to know about the transport protocols. So let's get into some meat. Let's send some messages. Let's make this boring demo actually do something. All right, I'm going to close all this stuff, shut down my server. Let's go back into our app. All right, come on, VS Code. There you go. All right. Uh, no real good place to start. We're going to start in the hub, and we're going to worry about that text box because that's what we want to do first. Uh, we have to create a method on the server that the clients can call when it wants to update the state on everyone's text box. So we'll create a new public async method because the any signal R method inside of a hub will return a task. It's all asynchronous. My number one consulting gig is awaiting people's signal R calls because they don't realize that every signal R method that you create is asynchronous. It's literally the easiest money I've ever made. Hey. Oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait. <coughs> Pay me, please. Uh, so we'll just call this sync text box. And sync text box is going to take a string. And we'll just say text box. And when this method gets called, which it will be called by a client, we want to turn around, take the contents of text box, and send it to all our connected clients that aren't the person making the call. So how do we get that connection list? Well, because we're implementing Hub, we have this collection called Clients. And this is a data structure that knows about every single connection to our server at this time. I can say clients.all, and it will send a message to all the connected clients, including myself. So myself being, if I'm the tab that's making the request. But that's not, not necessarily what I want. I want to send this to all the others that are connected to this server. We'll say send async. And I'm going to pass in a magic string. There's other ways to do this. I'm just using magic, magic strings for demo purposes. I need to tell my clients what method they need to execute on their side. And again, we're going to call this sync text box just to keep everything the same. And we're going to pass in our string. And we're going to await on this call. Now, Kevin, what happens if I don't await on this call? The message may or may not go through. It all depends on how your server is feeling at that time. Because uh, what happens is, if you don't await, threads might terminate prematurely. It's a whole mess. And then you call me, and I charge you a lot of money to fix it. Uh, so we'll wait on our call, seeing text box. Let's go over to the client. So let's go ahead and set up the first event. So on our connection, we can say on sync text box, let me pass in a function. So this is the local event sync text box, which correlates to the call that we're making on the server. So technically, when the server calls the, the clients to say, hey, sync text box, here's the text. This is the method that gets called. We are going to. Take our text box 
and set the value on it to text. Yay. Now, what if I'm the one changing the text box? Or I have the event handler set up for the text box, all the fancy HTML stuff. We are going to go to our connection. And we are going to ask it to invoke a method on the server called sync text box. Uh, casing doesn't technically matter here. And I'm going to pass in the value of target dot value. Type something in text box, hit tab enter, whatever, it calls a change event. Assuming we have an existing connection, we're going to send a message to the server telling the server invoke sync text box with a given value. It's going to execute that method sync text box, passing in the parameter, which will turn around and send the message to everyone else. Now that all sounds good. Let's make sure I actually coded this correctly. Nope. Oh. Uh oh. Hey. Uh, remind me what namespace task is in. Hey, who said that? There you go. Is it task or task? Just system not threading? Yeah, I'm going to owe you a cookie. Nope, never mind. I don't owe you a cookie. Hey, there you go. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, let's assume everything connected. There's no console errors. Oops. All right, everything's good in the console now. I'm going to create two instances of this app from side by side. And I'm going to type Kevin and hit enter. When I hit enter, we got our local event handler. It took this stuff out of the text box, sent it to the server saying, I want to call the sync text box method with the term Kevin, turns around, sends that to all the other connected clients, one. And it gets the value Kevin, drops it in the text box, and we're all good. We put these side by side. We can show you, it goes either way. Yay. Now I know that is not the most impressive demo, but that is 90% of signal our work, is just handling messages uh, between the clients and the server in this form. Um, now, those who don't like magic strings, there's a way to create what I, uh, I call them strongly typed hubs, where you can create an interface and everything can be strongly typed. So you don't have to say send async sync text box. Um, that takes about 15 minutes to get into, so I'm not doing it in this talk. But I happen to have a course that talks about all that stuff. You can get it for 13 pounds. Um, all right, so for the sake of time, I'm not going to wire up the checkbox. The checkbox is basically the same thing with a different data type. So you notice I'm passing in a string, but I could very as well pass in a Boolean. I could pass in a full object. What I want to get into now is actually sending more complex objects, but selectively sending messages to only people that want to get them. And that's where these buttons come into play, start notifications, and in notifications. So one of the things that are, that's been happening in the background is I've been running this uh, user generator. Every 10 minutes, we go and generate a new user, and we don't do anything with it. What would be nice is selectively sending that message to, uh, to our page only for the people that want to receive those messages. So let's go into our code. Let's shut this down real fast. And I'm going to add two more methods. Start notify, and then end notify. So start notify is going to get called whenever I press the start notifications button, end notify when I press end notification. You all can figure that out. When I press start notify, I want to add myself, my connection, to what we call a group. 
And a group is a logical way to organize uh, connections in your applications. So maybe uh, when I log in, uh, I'm an administrator. So we might have a special group for just administrators or administrative connections. Um, I might have, uh, I might be looking at a widget if I have a widget page. Well, a specific widget, I might have a group for just updates to a specific widget. Uh, when we're done, I'm going to show you an actual client's um, application I wrote where we use groups uh, religiously. Uh, but just think of the idea of a group as a logical grouping of, of connections. So we're going to say groups. Oh, I don't have my IntelliSense. That's all right. That's why I have notes. I'm going to add to group async. And this takes two parameters. The first is my connection ID. And because I'm implementing hub, I get clients, I get groups, I also get this context. Context represents the current connection for the current tab, the current window that's looking at this app. And it has a connection ID. Then I need to tell it which group I want to uh, add this connection to. And we'll just call it notify me. All right. If I don't want to be in the group anymore, or programmatically something happens and I want to be removed from the group, I can say remove from group. And same thing, context, connection ID, and I'll remove myself from notify me. Excellent. Let's go back to the JavaScript. All right, I have my two buttons. Now you might already be able to figure out how we call these. I can say invoke, start notify, and then invoke and notify. This adds me to the group or it takes me out of the group. Let's wire up a case where we actually want to do a notification. And for this, I'm going to bring up my sample code just to copy and paste. Here we go. So on the connection event that we'll eventually get called new user, uh, I'm going to get a user object from the server. And all I'm going to do with that user object is display some toast uh, with the person's name and picture and all that good stuff. Over on the server, where am I going to get the notification from? Well, I'm taking advantage of ASP.NET Core background services. Runs automatically, runs forever until you sh uh, shut it down. Uh, well, I have a case here where I go to the server, go to a server, get a user, and I have a to-do. And to-dos are fun, aren't they? I mean, it's work you have to do in the future. Well, let's go ahead and, all right, I'll do this part by hand. I need to get a reference to all my clients that are currently connected. Well, I can't do that easily because I'm not in the hub. I'm outside of the hub. And this is another common question. How do I send messages to users when I'm not inside of a hub? I might be in a controller. I might be in another service or somewhere else in the app. Well, everything in SignalR depends on ASP.NET Core or .NET dependency injection. So I can inject an iHub context of sync hub. And this gives me uh, basically a reference to all my connected clients on this server. So now I can come down where I say to do SignalR, I can send I can say hub context clients dot all, nope, group. I can pass in the name of the group, notify me, and tell them to send async. Nope, yep, no, then I'm right, sorry. And what's the name of the method I chose? New user. So on the message new user, I'm going to pass in, uh, what is it, r dot first dot, yeah. 
results dot first. All right, let's assume again that I did everything correctly. This is build. The only unit test that matters. And I failed. Oh, because I was dumb and didn't make it private. And then down here we'll say, oops, and that's not right. Okay, let's try it again. Oh, I have a call that's not away. Did I bring my own rule? Yes, I did. Where were you all, folks? I could have given you money for that, but oh well. Let's restart the app because we definitely don't want to test that theory right now. We'll restart again. Let's go ahead and open up a new tab. Make sure everything connects correctly. All right, I'm going to say start notifications. Uh, so what happened underneath the scenes? Oh, there it comes right away. All right, so welcome, Grayson. And we sit here and let it run for a moment. Every 10 seconds, Every day, hey, we have a new, new person that pops up. That's because I subscribe to the notifications for this particular app. If I open up another tab, and they're both connected. All right, we get the notification on one side. So I'll start notifications on the right side. Well, wait a moment, they sh should both get the same notification. Levi, cool. So we're selectively sending messages only to clients that want to receive them. And if I hit in notify on the right side, it should not get the next notification because I've removed myself from that group. There we go. Well, let's talk a little bit deeper about connections and groups. I want to show you more fancy demo stuff. All right, so there's a variety of ways to filter clients. Uh, the one that we saw earlier, so think about our infrastructure like this. We have our server. We could technically have two or three or 15 or 50,000 servers. And all of our connections are connecting to the server. Um, if I want to send a message to all my clients, no matter what, I can filter my clients with the, uh, the all collection. So clients at all will send a message to all the connected clients that want to receive it. Sometimes I only want to send a message back to the person that made the original call. So here, when I press send or start notifications, I am technically the caller, the person making the call to the server. Uh, that was client A, the server might say, well, let's send a message back to only the person that made the original call. So only I get that message. We saw earlier, if I want to send the message to everyone other than the caller, I can say clients.others. So A sends the message in, everyone else gets a response. Uh, this is really useful when you know A already knows the new state, so something changed, you don't need to confuse uh, client A by sending the information back to it. Uh, it really depends on the setup of your app. Now, this is where it starts to get really weird. You can filter connections uh, by connection ID. So I could say send to all clients except connections C and E. So everyone else gets it. Uh, these are filters I've never used in a production application. I think they exist because somewhere there was a design meeting where they said, oh, this would be a good idea to have. I've never seen it used. Clients.client, you can send to a specific client. So if you know the connection ID of a specific client, you can send a message directly to them. I don't recommend this. Uh, there's a, I have a 
very long article on why you shouldn't do this. It has to do with scaling and stuff like that, but I don't use this method. But you could if you wanted to. You can specify multiple clients, D and F. If you, and this is uh, just a list of parameters. So you could stack as many as you wanted to into that list. Uh, if you're using identity, ASP.NET Core identity, and you have an I user principle, you can use that user principle to identify specific connections. So if I told SignalR to send a message to Kevin, SignalR is going to know, based off user principle, which connections are Kevin, and it will send messages directly to those. This is hit or miss, in my experience, on, in scaled environments. Uh, locally, it works great all the time. Scaled environments, it can be hit or miss. You can specify multiple users. So if you know uh, a variety of user principal names, you can send to everyone that you want to, Kevin and Sally. Then we can get into groups. This is where I, I think the real power of single R is. I use groups all the time, uh, specifically as a solution to managing connection IDs. Because it's so much easier to put connections into a group and send to a group instead of trying to manage connection IDs directly or even trying to manage things like user principle. Um, I will, in every application, automatically put an authenticated user into their own group, like user Kevin. That way, anywhere in the application, if I know I need to send a message to Kevin, I can send, say, group dot user Kevin. I don't care how many connections Kevin has. Kevin will get uh, the message on all his connections. And this syntax is the same way. Clients.group, send async, call a particular method on the clients. Uh, oh, so here I have the server, and then I have the connections broken up into, well, this is supposed to be orange, uh, orange and yellow. Uh, so only the orange group gets, gets a message. You can filter this a little bit more. I don't do this either. Uh, everyone in the group except a particular connection or particular connections, you could do this. Again, I don't think it's worth your time. You can send the multiple groups. I've done this a handful of times as well. Um, so everyone in yellow, everyone in orange, they all get the message. And if you're a caller in a group, you could say others in the group with me. So if I'm connection A, I say send to all the others in the group yellow. Only B and C will receive the message. All right, now I've talked a lot about groups and all this stuff. I've shown you probably the worst demo ever. Um, don't give me yellow on that, please. Or red. Just give me green. Uh, I'm going to show you an application um, I worked with. This is a nonprofit uh, based in the United States called the National Institute of Public Safety Technology. And I'm going to bump this font up a little bit for y'all. Uh, let me explain a little bit how it works in the United States. Because So over here, what is it, 999, emergency services. Um, in the United States, we have 911. And when you live in a populated city, like like a New York City, or I'm from a place called Norfolk, Virginia, uh, we have dedicated emergency services all over the place. In some rural parts of the United States, you, you don't have emergency services right down the street from you. Uh, you might have emergency services in a county over, or if they're in your county, they're, they're miles and miles away. Uh, so the solution to the problem of how do we get emergency services to people as quickly as possible. Uh, we, I worked with this team to work on this system called LiveCat that aggregates emergency service data from a variety of uh, call centers. So if you call into our 911 emergency services and say, uh, I'm sick or elevator emergency, that sounds horrible right now because it is 7 in the morning on the West Coast, or in Midwest. I'm trying to think of the time there. Yeah, it's early, and they're stuck in an elevator. That sounds bad. Uh, so we're getting information from all these emergency services. You can actually tell we have uh, different colors for the emergency uh, the services. So there's West, 
LCRCC and FAIR. Uh, they're sending information in our system. We're quickly aggregating it, and we build these dashboards uh, for different um, uh, firehouses, emergency services, and whatnot. So the way this works in, uh, in the firehouses is someone might be in the firehouse looking at the, the screen. It's up on a big TV. And if something really bad happens that I need to be aware of, this screen flashes bright red just over and over again. So thankfully, that's not happening right now. But when that happens, it's our cue that we need to suit up, get into the truck, and head out to, to a service call. Uh, when I first came on to this project, it, the, the request wasn't like the, the beginning of the talk. Hey, we're hitting this endpoint too many times. It was worse, like way worse. Uh, they had a dashboard that looked very similar to this. We didn't change the look too much. But it was uh, ASP.NET Web Forms. Who's done that? All right, who remembers update panel? All right, it, this was in an update panel. The whole thing was an update panel. Not like little update panels here and there. The whole thing was an update panel. Um, when that update panel rendered, it would go to the database, the SQL Server database, on the same box as the IIS server. And it would ask the database, all right, give me the, the trucks, the resources we call them. Give me the list of incidents that I need to know about for a configuration. And uh, hey, by the way, also tell me what color everything should be. Why are you asking the database what color stuff should be? Uh, so it's doing all this work on the database. It comes back, builds the HTML, delivers the update panel, re-renders the screen. And it does that every one second across thousands of clients. And they said, Kevin, our CPU is like at 99% all the time. And we're maxing out all the memory. And I went, yeah, <laughs> I can see why. We can fix that. So we refactored. We actually we rewrote the entire backend in .NET. It's like .NET 4.7. It was a newer .NET framework. It was before core. Uh, and we had used Signal R for .NET framework. And it's since been. Uh, refactored again. It's now currently running .NET 6. It's all up to speed. Mm. So we went through and we built it with this concept of we're sending data into the server. The server is going to aggregate it, and it's going to selectively send updates to clients based off of their uh, configuration information. So if I look at this list, we have all these different configurations of how data can be viewed. And they all have their own unique ID. Now, I have a SignalR group for all these different IDs. When I go to, let me just pick something. Uh, no active incidents. Let's go back to Mecklenburg. That's a, this is better. Because there's actually data in here. When I load this view, I, behind the scenes, we make a call. Hey, add me to the group uh, OH25 MEC3. So now, when the server gets data that comes in and realizes, hey, uh, OH25 MEC3 needs to know about this, I get a message telling me that something has changed, whether it's a resource or an incident. But a lot of the time, like right now, it's just sitting here not doing anything because there's nothing to be done. We deployed this. Now, we deployed it to an Azure app service, so we made a change. We took them off the box under the table. And uh, we loaded it up, and I'm watching things like CPU and memory utilization, and it was like 1%. <laughs> and people were hitting the server. I'm like, oh, crap, I broke it. I broke something. I, I, whatever I pushed in production is not working. Um, I'm like, oh, crap, they're going to sue me. This is going to be horrible. And it turns out it was working just fine. It was just we had taken all the load off the server, all the load off the database. And we were using a more intelligent way to send data down to different clients. So everything was push notifications instead of pull notifications. Um, and this has been running in production for years. And we've just made updates to things like the .NET framework and to .NET Core and keeping the libraries up to date. Uh, so the story that happened after we pushed this out, they got a write-up in the industry magazine that said uh, there was some folks in a firehouse. They were doing their normal night shift stuff. The screen started flashing red. 
And right up, oh, that's something we got to do. They get suited up, they get in the truck. Doors open, truck is out the door. The moment the truck is out the door, uh, dispatcher comes over the intercom and says, there's medical emergency, here's the address, whatever. Folks are already out the door. They're heading towards the emergency. We have designed a system that is faster than a person coming over a, a, an intercom. And what's important about that is maybe someone in here, you have a loved one, or even a person you don't like, has had a medical emergency like a stroke, heart attack, uh, something that requires life-saving attention as soon as possible. You know that every second counts. And we used a silly thing like Signal R to build a system that gets emergency personnel to life-saving resources faster than a human can get life-saving resources to a, um, to a person. So that's why I tell everyone I save lives with WebSockets. Uh, and I actually have an entire talk just on that, on this app um, that I, I'm not doing here. But this is kind of the culmination of all the ideas and putting it into real practice, not just theoretical, like dumb, dumb demo that I had before. Um, but I have about nine minutes left. I am happy to answer any or all questions that you have. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me here at NDC. And I hope you've enjoyed yourself, maybe learned something. Yes, sir. Yep. The, all right, uh, so the question is about the Azure Signal R service. Um, we're getting into a scaling discussion here. Uh, so I get to tell my story of how I DDoS myself. How about that? When, if I go back a whole bunch of slides, I really should put a slide in here for this because it's super useful. Uh, let's go to this slide. This is a good slide. Uh, I had an app we built on Signal R. .NET Framework. Uh, so Old Signal had this philosophy where I could have multiple hubs and only one WebSocket. So uh, the, the concept was like MVC controllers. You'd have a hub for different, different ideas. So we would uh, create multiple hubs for, for accounts, for users, for this, for that, and they all used one WebSocket. When we made the refactoring to .NET Core at the time, and they rewrote Signal R, uh, they changed the philosophy and said, well, it's a WebSocket per hub. So I had five hubs. So imagine five little lines going to each client, each client, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, so on, so on. Now, uh, our users would instinctively always have 10 to 15 tabs open just by the, because of how the application works. Multiply that by thousands of users at any one time. We pushed the changes live and went, oh, this is working great, until we hit our peak time at 10 a.m. East Coast time um, that first Monday. And I keep getting emails from the clients that say, server's really slow. All right, let's figure out what's happening. Server's restarting itself. I had three servers running in a load balance set. It kept restarting itself every uh, every couple minutes, because it was running out of memory. It was exhausting all the sockets on that server. Because not only was it web sockets, it was HTML requests, JavaScript requests, CSS, so on, so on, just regular API calls. Um, so I was killing these servers. All right. W like, have you ever had to do a refactoring on the fly under stress? Like that's, that was me for the next 12 hours was refactoring this application to get it down to two uh, hubs while maintaining all the functionality and not breaking anything. Um, so the, the lesson learned there was you only want to have one WebSocket per app, really. To bring that to Azure Signal R service, uh, Azure Signal R service uh, solves two problems. One, it takes the socket connections off your server. So let's imagine Azure's over here. Your app doesn't connect to your server. It connects to Azure Signal R service. 
and then proxies requests to your server. Uh, so automatically, you're cutting every WebSocket connection from your server. You don't have to manage it. That's, that's great. Uh, that's great if you have stable, predictable load. It's not great if you have peaks and valleys. Um, actually, I have a whole section on this in the course. I'm not trying to push the course, but I have a whole section on it. Uh, plus, like, math of the pricing. Because it's the pricing is the reason we didn't use it in this scenario. Uh, because our peak was however many thousand connections, um, and they do daily billing and not hourly billing. So we couldn't scale just for the four-hour period that we needed it. We'd have to scale it for the entire day. and wasn't cost effective. Um, the other thing it does is it acts as a backplane. So if I have multiple servers in a load balance set, uh, there's a problem. If I have multiple servers load balanced, if I say clients are all, well, there's really just all the clients on that server. Doesn't necessarily include this, all the clients on the other servers. So if I'm connected to server A and someone else is on server C, they, they're not gonna get my message. We have a way of solving that, it's called a backplane. You can use Redis, which is an amazing backplane that you can host yourself. Or you can use Azure Signal R service that takes care of that for you automatically. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. It's a very specific scaling um, case where you know, if you don't have that many users, you don't have that much load, Azure Signal R service is not necessarily for you. I wouldn't spend the, well, it's 50 US dollars for one can, up to 1,000 connections, um, which is actually a good deal, but you don't need it. Oh, LiveCAD uses Azure Signal R service because we have predictable load all the time. We know exactly what we're paying for. We pay for two units all the time. Uh, so 100 US dollars to basically take all the stress off the server for uh, socket management. Uh, the biggest reason we did that was not only are our users uh, firehouses and emergency services, we also have people that like to listen to police scanners and just are really nosy on what's going on. They pay us a uh, donation so they can see all that data. Um, I'm not sure if that's a, is that a thing over here? People just like to listen to police scanners and, no? You're all not nosy like that? It's just an American thing? Okay, cool. Uh, I would totally believe that if you said, yes, Kevin, that's totally an American thing. Um, but that's the, that's the big use case for Azure Signal Service. You could technically write your own if you wanted to. I don't remember, it might have been David, David Fowler, uh, the gentleman who wrote Signal R. Uh, he does a demo, which he might have done at NDC 2020, uh, where he writes, basically writes his own uh, Signal R service. Um, there's not a lot of documentation on that, and I think there should be, because you could technically write your own if you wanted to. But that's an excellent question. Thank you, sir. Yes? Can you just explain how it works when you have multiple types of connections? Because you are on server in London, one in the US. Yep. Uh, you would, um, what I was just talking about, having backplane. So it's a, the servers connect to uh, something that lets them communicate with each other. Whether that's Azure Signal R service that you have to pay for, or you can use your own with Redis server or Redis. Um, Azure Redis cache works fine. We use that. You can set up your own Redis server. Talk to that man about Redis. Um, that's, that's the cheaper alternative and works great. We use it for hundreds of users uh, an hour um, without any issue. Uh, and I have other apps where we've done thousands of users. But that's the way you solve it is you tell all your servers connect to this Redis server and they will pub sub messages between each other. So uh, the server in uh, New York just sent a message. The server in London hears about it, picks it up, and sends it out to all of its users. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, say that a little louder. That's a great question. Does SignalR guarantee message deliverability? No. Actually, I actually have a whole article on it on my site. Um, there's not a mechanism in SignalR to, 
that can acknowledge messages coming back and forth between the servers and the clients. The best you can do is the clients can, can get an acknowledgement from the server that it successfully sent a message upstream, but there's no acknowledgement of the server sending messages down to clients. Uh, that's because connections are finicky. Uh, if I'm a WebSocket and a WebSocket gets disconnected, I, can't, I know about that immediately. But if I'm using server send events or long polling, I might not know about that disconnection for up to 15 minutes after it's occurred. And how many thousands of messages could have potentially been sent in that time. Uh, so SignalR doesn't guarantee it. Their documentation says they don't guarantee it. It's more, uh, it needs to be used as a pub sub. So you're just yelling out into the, out into the world that something's happened and whoever needs to listen for that message listens for it, but not necessarily, there's no acknowledgement model. Yep. The, the big thing we do is that we, uh, we look at connection events. So I get an event on both the client and the server when a connection gets cut. Uh, the client's most important, because the client's gonna know if it's disconnected before the server does. When the client gets uh, disconnected, gets severed, it's immediately gonna attempt to reconnect. Uh, there's automatic reconnection built into, well, not built in, you have to turn it on. So I'll automatically try to reconnect. When, but as soon as it's disconnected, we put up a message that says you're disconnected, we don't know what the current data is, it's, it's a big warning. As soon as a reconnection occurs, uh, which usually it does, it reconnects right away. As soon as a reconnection occurs, we assume all of our local state is bad. And we immediately go to the server and says, I need fresh state, pretend I just loaded, I need everything I might need to know. And we invalidate everything on the client. Um, the ser and the server, because the server might still be trying to send me messages. And those messages may or may not be getting through. So we put it on the client to reestablish the state of the page as it needs to be. Yeah, definitely. Oh, so, um, uh, so the question is that then first that I'm maintaining state on the client if I have to go back and ask the server for, for a new snapshot. Yes, yeah. So if I go back to LiveCAD, I'll just use LiveCAD as an example, and I'm a moment over my time. So we are maintaining all this local state at the moment. Uh, so I'm using Vue.js underneath the scenes with uh, Vuex for state management. Oh, see, it just refreshed. Um, when I get disconnected for any way, any reason, as soon as I reconnect, I do throw all this away, and I go to the server, and we have a process, we call it a resync. I'll say, I am looking at this configuration, please tell me everything I need to know. Like, don't assume I have any information. Uh, as soon as I get that resync, I start listening for updates. Um, and we just go back into the cycle we had before. Now, for mission critical stuff like this, we also have a sub process every couple minutes. We'll just do a check in to make sure that we have the current state of the application. Um, we we just assume we just assume local states going to go might get disrupted for any reason. That never happens unless you have a disconnection event, and then you know about it. Um, we just, we do it as a sanity check just in case, uh, but you don't, it's not necessary. Um, yep, stuff's updating. Oh, it's going flash red on it. So this is what happens in a firehouse during an emergency. Um, so some trucks get dispatched and hopefully they go put that fire out. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes. Theoretically, the, the Brosnan analyzers for async await should catch it because it's returning a task. 
And so it should identify, hey, we're returning a task. Obviously, you'll want to wait on this. Uh, in that particular kind of case, I don't think they had the analyzers turned on, or they were ignoring that one. Yes, Steve? You could just return a task, yeah. You de yeah, you actually don't have to do the await yourself. You could just return the task. Say that one more time. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. All right, friends. Well, I'll stick around for a moment if you have any other questions, but thank you all for coming out. <laughs>